Welcome to episode 10 of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity. I'm delighted to invite one of one of my own teachers, uh, the incomparable Dr. Elizabeth Clark. Um, before we begin, uh, a, a few announcements. First, uh, as we always do, we like to thank our anonymous donors for making this series possible. Um, we, we've, uh, we're receiving so many uh, notes of appreciation for this series and, and we couldn't do it without you, so, so thank you. Um, I, would like, I would also like to invite all of you to check out our webpage, which is fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. And there you will find um, archives of uh, the content that we do, um, links to our public orthodoxy editorial forum, as well as our upcoming events. And let me go ahead and just mention a couple of those that stand out. Uh, this Thursday, we will have a religion and nationalism webinar, uh, Thursday at 5 p.m. with Jose Casanova, Elizabeth Prodromo, and Eric Gregory. On November 6th, so just before and just after the election, on November, on November 6th, uh, we will have another um, webinar, this one a rescheduled event from last spring that we had meant to do in person and then we couldn't. And this is, uh, will be titled Orthodoxy and Anthropology in Conversation. It will be November 6th at 6 p.m. with Angie Hio, Alina Vuala, Sonia Thomas, Alexandra Antonin, and Bethlehem Dejean. Um, that really looks to be a, a really exciting event, um, and it will be moderated by two of our former fellows, Candace Lukasik and Sarah Riccardi Schwartz. Uh, and then the next episode in this series, episode 11 of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity, uh, will feature political scientist Effie Focas, um, who uh, resides in Greece. She's, she's American born, resides in Greece. Um, uh, and is an expert in political science. That will air on November 16th. So now we turn to the event at hand. Um, I, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clark, who is one of the world's most accomplished and influential scholars of early Christianity. She is John Carlisle Kilgo Professor of Religion Emerita at Duke University, where she taught for more than 30 years. Through her numerous publications, which include at least 14 books and nearly 100 academic papers, she pioneered the integration of gender studies and critical theory with early Christian studies. In addition to being one of the most prolific scholars of early Christianity, Professor Clark is also one of the most intellectually wide ranging having made substantive contributions to the study of philosophy in early Christianity, early Christian women, asceticism, the originist controversy, historiography, and the history of patristics as a discipline, to name just a few of the areas in which she has shaped the field. We will be talking about much of this. Uh, she was the co she was the founding co-editor of the Journal of Early Christian Studies, which is simply the most important journal in the field today, and a senior editor of church history. She has also been president of the American Academy of Religion, the American Society of Church History, and the North American Patristic Society. During her time at Duke, she mentored more than two dozen doctoral students, many of whom are now themselves leaders in the field of early Christian studies. Uh, let me add on, on a personal note uh, that I've known uh, Dr. Clark, Liz as we all affectionately uh, call her, uh, I've, I've known her for more than 20 years. I, I did my own uh, studies uh, in North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And if you know anything about these programs, you know they might hate one another on the basketball court, but they're very close um, in terms of the preparation of students. and. Uh, Liz was simply one of the most welcoming and generous scholars in my own intellectual development, and I've just, I've had extraordinary respect for her for so long. So I'm, I'm delighted to invite her uh, to the series and for us to continue to learn from her. So welcome, Liz. Thank you. 
Thank you, George. <laughs> Such a warm welcome. <laughs> Um, so well, let's begin this the way that we usually do, which is to simply um, give you the opportunity to explain how you got into the field as you did and, and maybe what some of the challenges were at, at, at the time, uh, especially for uh, women scholars. Yes. Oh. <laughs> when I think back on some of it, I could cringe. But anyway. <laughs> so, um, I went to graduate school um, right out of college and uh, I had ended up being a religion major in college with minors in history and philosophy. But uh, it shows how times have changed that I didn't really even know the very day I drove to New York to enter Columbia and Union Seminaries program which field I was going to be in. <laughs> was it going to be modern theology or was it going to be early Christian studies? And uh, I decided probably on that trip down, it better be early Christian studies. Uh, so that it was. Um, I had worried in college about becoming a religion major, like, like many uh, young women at the time or girls as we called ourselves then. <laughs> um, I, I didn't go to college with any particular ideas about what I was going to do in life. You just went to college. And was, um, when I became interested in uh, religious studies, uh, I was pretty sure I didn't want to become a minister. <laughs> so what were the other options? And it seemed to be becoming a professor was uh, the other uh, main option for that. So that was what I decided I would do if I went to graduate school and made it through and so forth. You know. So that was how I got to uh, graduate school. But I must say the training in um, early Christianity in, in those days at uh, Union and Columbia was <laughs> what should we say? I don't want to say weak, but there wasn't so much of it. <laughs> and their idea of programs was it was much broader than today. So I took all kinds of courses in 19th century theology. I took a lot of courses in Reformation studies, um, even sat in on a course on orthodoxy <laughs> uh, along the way. And in addition to some of the things I did in um, early Christianity. The first year in graduate school, the person who would be my advisor, Cyril Richardson, was on leave, so we didn't even have anyone teaching early Christianity the first uh, year I went. Um, but uh, that is how I uh, got into it. And um, the program there was, was pretty short. I, I finished up a master's and PhD in four years, wow. <laughs> and uh, which I would not advise for anyone today. There were so many defects of the program, including ancient languages, which um, today's students, you know, as a matter of course, think they ought to do more in you know, Syriac or Coptic, or, in addition, of course, to, to Greek and Latin. Uh, but uh, we didn't seem to have any of that <laughs> at the time. So. So in any case, in my last year, um, I um, did uh, interview for and got a job at, uh, in fact, to begin a department of religion at Mary Washington College, which was uh, then the women's undergraduate college at the University of Virginia. They kept the men and the women separate. <laughs> and uh, 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 today it is a great mystery to me how anybody hired me. I was 25 years old. In fact, I'd never stood in front of a classroom before when I got my PhD wow. <laughs> to start a program <laughs> in uh, religious studies. So that was sort of how I got um, into it now. Yeah. And, and and did you uh, the um, you mentioned they didn't really do language training, but you obviously know these languages very well. So did you just sort of realize that you needed to do that on your own? Like where where did that come from? Well, I did, yeah, I done Latin in, in school and did some more the summer before I went to graduate school. My father had told me he would not 
uh, pay for me to study Greek because he thought it was dilettantish. So I only started <laughs> Greek my first year as a master's student. That was terrible. It would have been so much better if I'd had several years of Greek uh, behind me, so to speak. And when you think of the training of scholars, like, for example, Avril Cameron, who was on your program yeah, <laughs> a, yeah. few, uh, a few weeks ago here, that uh, they started so much earlier in age and get so much more thorough training, which uh, yeah, I really deeply, deeply regret that for most Americans that <laughs> kind of training really doesn't seem to be ava available unless you go to some kind of private school where such things are taught. Yeah. Right. And were there, um, I, I'm just curious with the makeup of the, when you arrived, I, I, I mean, were you the only woman? Were, were there a, a few others uh, when you arrived at Columbia? Uh, there were a few in my beginning master's classes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of whom soon dropped out and got a PhD in English and went on to teach English at a uh, college. Yeah. Um, but there was maybe only one other who actually graduated with a degree in um, so early Christianity, history, Christianity kind of study. So there weren't yeah. many. I would say I have had only one woman professor of religion my entire wow. undergraduate and graduate career, and that was Susan Sontag, which might surprise people, but for a few years she did teach some courses and kind of theory, philosophy type things in the Columbia University department, and uh, I did have a course or two with her, which was um, what well, intimidating, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay, so, so let's turn to to some of your uh, to your the scholarly contributions, right? I, I, I mean, I anyone who's tuning in um, and, and knows your reputation know that you, as much as anyone else, really has shaped the current field in, in early Christian studies uh, in in so many important ways. I, I mean. We could talk about so many, so many of the different things you wrote. I, I actually want to start, if, if you don't mind, with one of one of your just smaller kind of off articles um, that, at least for me, when I was in graduate school, I read. And I was like, oh wow, this is like, like it just kind of opened up new ways of thinking about things. I mean, it wasn't your theory heavy stuff that you do that transforms everybody's uh, work, but just this article that you wrote. At, at this point, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, called Patrons, Not Priests, uh, Gender and Power in Late Antiquity. Um, and for me, it just captures so well um, the way that women both were and were not leaders in early Christianity. Can, can, can you just tell us uh, about the article and, and what, what intrigued you about, about the questions that animated it and so forth? This is an article that came out, what, 1990, somewhere around there? <laughs> I, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, in any case, 1990 in the, yeah. the journal Gender and History. So, mm -hmm. um, well, it was, um, I think it stemmed out of, I'd already written quite a lot about women ascetics, especially the rich ones <laughs> yeah. who, who got written about by these various um at church writers, uh, the fathers here. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was, uh, I was sort of curious as to uh, what, what did, what could they offer that uh, they were, uh, uh, of course, banned from the priesthood or excluded from the priesthood. Uh, whether or not that was exactly always the case has been the question uh, much discussed, uh, I think, back in those years, whether there really were some women priests, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and there seem to be uh, various reasons for why Christianity as it developed and became more sort of hierarchical and uh, ritualized and sacramentalized that uh, women were not going to be part of that. But what could they do? Well, they did have some helping kind of offices in the church. But I was particularly interested in this issue about patronage, which, of course, was a very basic feature of life in, in Roman society, that um, 
in, in times even before Christianity, males uh, very often made their mark by, if they had any money, <laughs> by giving various structures and uh, to their community, if you could erect uh, baths and roads and aqueducts and things that uh, you would receive some uh, praise for this. And uh, see that there are a few women here or there who could give to their communities like that. Certainly by uh, the time you get into the fourth century, um, most of the inscriptions you can find <clears throat> about men come from men who were sent out to be imperial officials once the huge structure of the Roman Empire be expanded so much and became quite bureaucratic. And um, these men would then give to the communities that they allegedly served and uh, very often were rewarded with things. So, so how, were, how did women become patrons? Well, what, what they could become patrons of was uh, religious structures. Um, now, this depended first on having some money. Right. <laughs> I was thinking, looking at this essay again, or, or a lot of money, <laughs> as the case yeah. may be, uh, hearing Kim Bowes talk at a, uh, a Zoom meeting at, at Duke last week, uh, who, who's now for several years been working on peasants. She said, oh, I was so tired of rich people. <laughs> I just really <laughs> wanted to see what else there was. So she went to peasants who certainly were not rich. <laughs> Um, but uh, here it's, it's the rich, very, very wealthy women who uh, had money that they could give to build churches, um, to build monasteries, and some of them um, went into the monastic life. Um, here uh, is where asceticism kind of crossed with these wealthy women, you might say, and that uh, once they had the freedom to dispose of their money as they wished, <laughs> this was something they could uh, contribute to. You know. Now, technically in Roman law, uh, women had their property and money separate from their husbands, but it was certainly expected that women would use their money, married women in this class of society would use their money to... Um, further their husband's political careers, which cost some amount of money to put on all the shows and entertainments and so forth you were expected to do. But for women, once they were, if they had been married, once they were widowed, or for, as we go along in the fourth century and into the fifth century, um, young girls who absolutely refused to get married, often facing a lot of parental pressure to do so. Uh, but if they got to keep their money and use it the way they pleased, that um, building monasteries, giving to churches, uh, uh, even erecting whole churches, this was something that became possible. Now, the amounts of money were somewhat staggering. I was looking at the, the statistics in this, which are interesting. For example, uh, uh, Roger Bagnall, um, who was then at Columbia, mm -hmm. and uh, a conservative estimate for the value of one pound of gold would be about $75,000. And if you take that and look at, for example, the contributions of Olympias, John Chrysostom's friend, to the Church of Constantinople, uh, the 10,000 pounds of gold that uh, her biographer says she gave to the church become $750 million. <laughs> and you sort of go through these lists the same way for Melania the Younger and right, uh, right. others of these women. I mean, the amounts are absolutely staggering. These are very, very wealthy women. And so you can... Uh, see how men like John Chrysostom and Jerome and so forth were very eager to uh, encourage this kind of behavior and giving and uh, so forth. But it was, um, you know, asceticism in some ways that made a lot of this possible. Um, so I think here you have a kind of intersection of, you might say, intersection of uh, economics and right. uh, asceticism, et cetera. And of course, when you gave a lot of money for these things, you got written about or you had inscriptions put up 
honoring you for having given this church. <laughs> so it was one, one way, at least, in which Christian women of late antiquity did get some recognition for their contributions to the church. <laughs> Yeah, let me just kind of uh, kind of go go off script a little bit and just you know I'm curious about your your quest to find women in early Christianity, right? Right. I I, I once heard you give a give a paper on this at the, the American Society for Church History, right? But I, I mean, at one and the same time, like I I can just imagine the temptation to make a lot out of nothing, <laughs> right? And I can also imagine the reality of just depression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you speak to that kind of quest to find women in early Christianity? I, and I can indeed, and I was thinking of that as I was looking over that article. Yeah. That uh, Back in the 1970s, 1980s, even maybe into the beginning of the 1990s, uh, those of us who worked on these themes were so eager to find <laughs> a yeah. woman. You know, I think that uh, a lot of us, myself included, certainly, uh, tended to overlook the kind of material circumstances <laughs> mm -hmm. that undergird um, the very fact of why these women got written about, etc. You can be sure if Olympias or Melania were some peasant girl out in <laughs> Asia Minor, she would not get written about by these lofty males of the church and those treatises and letters and so on would not have come down to us in this kind of way. So it was looking for them and we were we were very delighted every time we could find a, a new one or one who had been overlooked. And I think it uh, that quest did a lot of good in terms of bringing women you know, into a kind of more central spot in thinking about early Christianity. But uh, I think on the other hand, we didn't always do it justice. I, I might say a book which is in press right now, and I'm reading page proofs and so on, is a new version of Melania the Younger. <laughs> and it's very different from the one I wrote back in 1981, 82. <laughs> Uh, so on, and it's much more about Roman history, it's much more about economics, about slavery, about agricultural production, and so on. So I've tried really hard to put Melania into a much bigger uh, kind of framework uh, of these, you might say, more material or quote-unquote secular <laughs> sort of yeah. concerns. Uh, so I hope that book will... Uh, be well received. We'll see. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. We'll certainly uh, look look forward to it. So, I, I mean, obviously, um, I, I, I mean, your work on gender studies in late antiquity is so important, but it's only one facet of, of the work you you've done, right? Um, you also really. Uh, pioneered uh, the appropriation of critical theory um, and using all kinds of other resources for thinking about early Christianity, right? Early Christianity isn't just about theology, right, anymore. Um, and uh, thanks to the work that you and, and Peter Brown and, 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 and others did, uh, maybe let's turn to a, a book that uh, came out maybe shortly before I uh, started, started um, I, I came to North Carolina myself, uh, the originist controversy, right, uh, which uses social network analysis, mm -hmm. uh, among other things, to explain uh, the partisan divides in various, you know, what were ostensibly the theological debates, but perhaps not so much so. So could you tell us about the origins of that project? And um. Yes, in fact, I think the origins of it were uh, one night at a dinner party. A <laughs> uh, uh, person at the gathering was a sociologist, started talking about some work she was doing in social network theory, and my ears perked up. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. And so I went to work. And um, social network theory was something that sociologists, uh, whatever, uh, found was a very helpful way of. Um, uh, trying to see how relations uh, between and among people in groups, <laughs> um, cases of friendships and hostility, for example, um, hierarchies, um, how these relationships themselves help determine uh, 
or what people within the group might think or do or whatever. I think one uh, person who was quite active in applying this to groups in modern America was Rodney Stark, whom some, some of you may know his work on um, um, Mormonism and other groups that um, do a fair amount of recruitment and how the social bonds among and between people really become quite decisive for um, the maintenance and expansion of these uh, groups. So I thought, well, <laughs> uh, this controversy at the end of the fourth century and just shading over a little into the beginning of the fifth century, um, allegedly over the writings of Origen and latter-day originists. Um, I wonder if this could be explained in some way by these social network uh, kind of theories, because we have a whole network of Jerome and his friends in Rome and elsewhere. We have a whole network of friends centered on uh, Rufinus of Aquileia, who is the translator into Latin of origins on first principles, and Melania the Elder, who provided the money for some of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then many, many people who knew all these famous people. <laughs> so that you could actually work out what the networks were. And uh, in an article in the journal Semea, I actually drew the little circles with all the, the links between this group and between the group, between say Jerome's group and Rufinus group. And, um, and you could link all kinds of things like gift giving, travel, letter writing, hospitality given and received, et cetera. And you could plot these all out. And you could see how dense the networks were. So I started thinking about this book, imagining I might write it, um, just trying to explain the whole controversy on the basis of these chains and links of friendship and hostility and so forth. Uh, well, of course, I was quickly disabused of that because there were a lot of theological issues there. Mm -hmm. But certainly the uh, the networks of people for and against <laughs> origin and originism um, played played a, a big role in how this uh, controversy all worked out. So, uh, um, I think uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, most exciting things for me working on that project was to discover for the first time in my life a Vagrius Ponticus, uh, who is now a very big star in early Christian studies yeah, and yeah. will be even more of a star when we get an English translation of his major works that should be out, I hope, before too long. Yeah. Um, and uh, so forth. But uh, to take one, one example here, the whole question about um, images. <laughs> uh, humans are supposedly created in the image of God. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, Christians are taught to think of God as incorporeal. On the other hand, if we're in the image of God, what does that mean about bodiliness and so forth? And uh, big fights over uh, this emerged. Uh, Avagrius was a partisan of no images at all. Um, not even mental images in your mind, his idea was, that if you could really uh, just erase from your mind any kind of images in prayer, you would achieve a state of kind of pure prayer where all you kind of saw was light. <laughs> But um, of course, this business about the image of God got into all kinds of uh, other related uh, themes about the creation of human bodies. When had it happened? Had we all been, as Origen allegedly held, uh, naked minds <laughs> back in the pre-creation state and that the uh, kind of pre-cosmic fall had been a fall into bodies, which uh, some of the partisans in this debate saw well was uh, brought into question something about the goodness of the material body and so forth. Uh, and certainly reproduction. 
And as you went along in the uh, development of the originous controversy, you can see how the major themes changed a bit. Back in the 370s or so, uh, Epiphanius of Salamis um, certainly was very anti-origin, but he concentrated on things like uh, origins alleged subordinationism, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is of the son of God to God the father, et cetera, which he blasted here, yeah. uh, et cetera. As you go towards the end of the fourth century, increasingly the issues center on the body, reproduction. And what you can see there is how the ascetic movement, again, has come in and influenced so strongly what this controversy was going to be about, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it didn't last for very, very long. Um, some of the major participants in it, including a baker, as Ponticus died, you know, uh, et cetera. But I think it had long lasting effects in that, uh, as I sort of uh, concluded at the end, that some of the ideas that Origen had fostered of it, want a, a more, a larger uh, cosmological approach <laughs> uh, to theology, um, championing the idea of human freedom and uh, of God's justice, which was certainly um, important to him. And that, um, uh, Origen had to fight, uh, I think, uh, the um, more astrological determinists, that any kind of determinism was um, out. So, but some of these, uh, some of these ideas, you know, got carried on in different forms. And when we think about Augustine and the Pelagians mm -hmm. later in the West, Augustine didn't really know much about the originist controversy. And, he never, never, the one thing Augustine never pronounced on was what is the origin of the soul, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, which could get you in trouble whichever way around you yeah, yeah. decide to do it. So he just didn't say anything about it there <laughs> uh, in that uh, respect. But um, certainly some of Augustine's opponents of Pelagians accused him of determinism. So you're back into different controversies about free will and determinism and a very different cast, of course, than at the time of origin. But I thought it was a fascinating, fascinating controversy. And there were so many people involved in it, just looking over my footnotes and oh, <laughs> how did I ever know all these things? I guess I did at one time. <laughs> but many, many people were involved in this and um, in part because um, these very famous people, such as Chrysostom and Jerome, et cetera, were well connected all over their, their form of the, uh, the known world at the time. So this is a very international um, kind of dispute as well, you might say. So. Right. Well, so that's that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let, let me make a quick uh, uh, announcement here that I, I failed to make ahead of time. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen, there's a little Q&A button. And uh, I, have a, well, I have a few more questions for Dr. Clark, but then we'll open it up if anyone has uh, questions of their own that you, you would like to ask her. Um, so just type in your, your, your questions into the Q&A chat and we'll go, we'll go through those in a little bit. Um, one of the things uh, about the the or the origin book, um, I think, is it really uh, for for scholars like myself and and people in in the field, it, it really changed the way that we thought about theological controversies. Right, that that they weren't. It wasn't just about ideas. I mean, the ideas do matter, right? Um, the ideas do matter, but it's not just about ideas. And, and that kind of brings me to the to just really thinking about the relationship between religious studies and theology, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I, I mean, even when, so when I was in uh, graduate school in the 90s, right, there were the, the religious studies and the theology debates and, and so forth. It, it probably looked different in, in the 60s. It looks different today. Um, I, I, I mean, can you reflect upon uh, that relationship and how, how you've 
uh, not only influenced it, <laughs> but but uh, just how, how you've seen it over the years and, and where you think it is now and, and so forth? Yeah, certainly when I was in graduate school, I was just remembering my master's essay was on the Christologies of Apollinaris of Laodicea and Cyril of Alexandria. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it was not historicized, yes. or whatever. It was about ideas. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and uh, one thing uh, I think uh, historians at least certainly learned was uh, ideas do not just float around in the world. They are connected. This is one way why something like network theory is very useful. You know, who actually wrote treatises and letters to other people and how did they get there and who read them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you can do more kind of historical work around the ideas, I think you've got a better theology. And I'd like to think that that has become more prominent. Um, I wouldn't say entirely. I was certainly from occasionally I look at real theology books today and mm -hmm. um, some of them still seem to be wafting around in the air of these <laughs> ideas sort of drifting somehow. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the historicization of theology is uh, um, at issue here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And um... Uh, let's talk more. I, I mean, you've mentored you've mentored so many students, ma ma male male and female. Um, but uh, you, you you know you came up you you and Avril both right. You you came up at, at, at a time you 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 broke ground at, at a time when there there were so few women doing it, and and um, there were just so many institutional obstacles uh, for women to advance in the academy. Um, can, can you reflect on, on, on your on your career in that way and, and what you see are the sort of opportunities and remaining challenges for, for female scholars? In a way, I think it was lucky I started teaching at what was an all women's college at the beginning, at Mary Washington College, and uh, there were a lot of women, there were more women professors than, than men professors, and uh, so, so you had a goodly core of friends there to support and uh, encourage you, uh, etc. So, um, However, one thing I could have said before was I, how I got into doing this women in religion and women in early Christianity stuff, in part was impelled by all my work on the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, um, my students find it hard to think of me out on the stump <laughs> back when we were trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed of uh, speaking before audiences with often quite hostile men who said some nasty things to me, I would say. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, I think it was my kind of activism in some way as, as part of the developing feminist movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s that then got me into uh, thinking, well, you know, I can read these texts and there's a lot in the texts about women. So, you know, I could put it together. So, um, but then when I came to Duke, I must say, I did find the atmosphere rather unfriendly. There were many, 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 many men. Yeah. Not when I was hired here at Duke as a full professor, at the time I was hired in 1982 in the whole College of Arts and Sciences, which had about 500 uh, faculty members then. There were only four women who were full professors, and then one of them died. <laughs> so, I mean, what this meant when I look over my CV, I kind of gasp and put it back down. You are asked to be on every single committee about anything. I always said, if you could tie your shoes and write a committee report, you were in, you know. <laughs> and yes, it took some time away from my. Uh, scholarly work and work with students, but I feel like Duke needed a lot of improvement <laughs> in those days, and as did various other organizations I was part of. So I, I do feel I spent some of my energies in, in those days of um, trying to foster and help things about women's issues, including salary, of course, which we still read about in the papers from week to week, <laughs> women professors protesting, and winning their cases, et cetera. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if it's okay with you, we, ha we have some questions uh, co coming in, and I'll, I'll turn to some of them from, from the audience, right? So the first one is from Carl Schuve. Uh, 
Uh, what do you think still can or needs to be done by those of us who work on women, gender, and sexuality in late antique Christianity? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably one could go further chronologically. Certainly the way I was trained and many other people, it, uh, it was a pretty short period of, you know, late end, we didn't even call it late antiquity then. But, uh, I, th I think particularly in Protestant uh, kinds of seminaries and teaching, uh, once you got through Constantine and so forth, there wasn't much else to do except, well, a passing uh, jump uh, into Augustine, but then here <laughs> on to. But now, of course, there's uh, so much more about the fifth century, sixth century, seventh century, and um, I think scholars of late antiquity could uh, you know, find more if they went there. Of course, also part of this requires more languages as some of my friends say, uh, friends who know Armenian tell me there's lots of good stuff about women in some of these Armenian sources, but yeah, <laughs> you have to be able to go find it there. So. Also, it would be very nice to think we could find out more about women in the lower classes, it's true. This, this field of women in early Christianity is totally dominated by rich women. Well, there's also martyrs, we can say, right? Yeah. If you get martyred, you can have something written about yeah. you. Uh, but, um, you know, ascetics certainly are the, the chief ones who get yeah. written about, and especially if they're wealthy. If so, they were wealthy yeah. to start, right. If you could find some poorer ones, <laughs> that would be useful, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay, so uh, now from Carrie Schroeder, who I know you know, lo know and love. Uh, my question is, have your views on gender and early Christianity changed over the years? And if so, how? Your article, The Lady Vanishes, marked a turning yeah. point, I think. Any others? Ah, uh, <laughs> thank you, Carrie. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're all so enthusiastic at the beginning to find, as they say, a woman, another woman, <laughs> and, and so forth. We didn't really look at how these women were constructed in a way by the male authors who wrote about them. It's all male authors writing about these female um, and, um, the females that, that they wanted to praise and honor here. So I had to take a, a somewhat more kind of skeptical view of the texts that we had and why they were written and so forth. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have I'm much more about that. As, as Carrie knows, I sort of turned my mind to other things, including like how did the study of early Christianity become a discipline in America, which has occupied me for the last what more than a decade, a <laughs> couple decades maybe. Yeah. Um, but um, I, th I think we have uh, people today probably have a more critical eye about how you deal with women in these sources and to remind that, that they are kind of textually constructed here by the men who wrote about them. Sure, sure. sure. I, I, I'll just say anecdotally, for, for the first time ever, um, I, I'm teaching a course called Women of the Christian East, and, and this, this, which I'm loving, and, and I, I have to give a shout out to my undergraduates, uh, female students who, who came to me and said, could you please teach this course? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, you know, I, I'm at pains to find anything actually written by women. Um, <laughs> that, uh, and so, but you, you know, it's just, it's, it's the challenge we have um, when, when we do this sort of thing, but um, yeah. Um, all right, so next question coming in, uh, this is from Victoria Leonard. Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about fit feminism, woman-oriented studies, and women in academia in the fields of early Christianity and ancient history, or more broadly? Oh, I, I think uh, optimistic in terms of the number of women who have gone into this field in the last 20 or 30 years, and the remarkable kind of work they're producing. Certainly also in, in ancient history too, and in classics, of course, which has always been a field that had quite a lot of women in it. <laughs> um, so that's all a good sign. Of course, one could worry a bit with the uh, current problems of colleges and universities and 
uh, spurred by our COVID moment here, whether there will be so many jobs the next few years, even if you get well trained, there's got to be a job out there for you. Yeah. But um, um, I do, feel, I, th I think, yeah, there's probably some more work to be done about women in early Christianity. Maybe, maybe it's had its uh, high point, we might say. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I think in a way it's now been incorporated into the sense into larger studies of early Christianity. So it's hard to think of courses in early Christianity being developed today by young professors that wouldn't have, you know, some nice chunks uh, about women and gender issues and so forth. Yeah. 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 Um, this is from uh, Dr. Upsunseya. Greetings from a former student in Southern California. I'm interested in hearing Liz's hopes for the future of the field. What recent scholarship excites her the most and or what new topics or methods would she recommend junior scholars taking up? Hi, Christy. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Um, I th yeah, I feel good about it. I, I think we could uh, all of us educate ourselves more in topics about pertaining to ancient economics, um, uh, kind of history of Rome and the East uh, in this period, and things that were not always very well covered, if covered at all, in our uh, training. So I think there's a lot more to read more widely in works written by classicists. And, um, there's a lot more work, of course, about different regions and areas that uh, We've become much more um, particular about not amalgamating everybody together and thinking what happened in Rome was the same as what happened in Cappadocia or Gaul or something. So to get more geographically specific about the particular conditions and developments in these areas, I think there's still quite a bit of work to be done on that. And certainly, um, you know, as Avril Kaminer talked about on this program a while ago, that uh, the push into the East, <laughs> Syria and further East has been very prominent, uh, I think, in um, studies more recently. So again, that's something where uh, more training in language is going to help a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll do a few more. Uh, one here from Katie Kleinkopf. Uh, thank you so much for speaking about the intersection of the women's movement and your own scholarship. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say more about the relationship between contemporary social justice movements and early Christianity, and if you're working on any projects which are informed by our current situation. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> what to say about that? Um, well, um, as I might write an article or something, I'm not sure, another whole book. Um, 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 what happened with the concept of the kingdom of God and how it's so early got transformed from being what it is in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, especially, all right, into something about going to heaven after you die, or something like this. Uh, but certainly in um, the earliest movement around Jesus, you know, there's plenty of concern about the poor and so forth, but it's thought that the coming of the kingdom of God is going to totally changed the world as we know it and a new kind of a, um, establishment, you might say, be set up uh, with the, um, the kingdom where justice would prevail and so on. And that of course is still um, <clears throat> very powerful incentive, just as some aspects of Paul's writings about slave and free and male and female and so on are very widely quoted and much contemporary literature about social justice, if anyone has 
you know, any kind of interest in bringing religion into that discussion. So, so I think there is something there. It is, on the other hand, one has to say it is rather discouraging, <clears throat> as I felt in working on this book about Melania, how, uh, you know, the huge preponderance of the issue of slavery and still mm -hmm. in late antiquity and how church fathers really did say nothing about this except we should all love each other and slaves should be obedient to their masters and masters should be kind to their slaves but in terms of any structural change nothing you know <laughs> they could dream about an eden maybe where things supposedly had been a little different <laughs> or was supposed to be different but um in terms of social issues so i um um, probably those issues are more up for critique in late antiquity than for giving much inspiration for the present moment. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we have one from Jarrell Robinson Brown. Do you have any advice for a young Black graduate student in the UK wanting to do work in Egyptian early Christianity? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's been a little bit of work in that in so far as just in a few texts here and there about Desert Fathers and so on, you get to occasionally mention of, you know, Ethiopians or something. Uh, there's not um, a lot, but, you know, Egypt seems to be a place where uh, there might be more to be uncovered uh, about that. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, of course, in, in Rome, <clears throat> or in the Roman Empire generally, slavery was not associated with race. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, it was uh, some, uh, determined in quite other sorts of ways. So uh, certainly you can <clears throat> uh, see here and there in various church fathers' writings that the term Ethiopian used as to represent some kind of demons who are black, <laughs> something like that. I'm not sure how much more there is there to find out, but uh, perhaps if you dig into the Coptic sources more, you may be able to find some more things. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're going to do two more, um, if, if that if that's okay with you. Um, this one I know comes from another one of your direct students, uh, Tina Shepardson. Mm -hmm. uh, could, mm -hmm. could you say something about how you have mentored others? Because you have mentored so many of us in such amazing ways, I would love to hear you think out loud for this audience about what makes for good mentoring and what has been important to you in doing it, what you have prioritized. Oh, hello, Tina. <laughs> Hope Tennessee is doing okay these days. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> mentoring. Well, um, I never had graduate students before I came to Duke, and so I kind of fell into getting these um, graduate students coming um, after the first year or two or so that I was here. And I really didn't know quite what you were supposed to do. I've, I've always believed, and I think I've stuck with this, that um, <clears throat> graduate students, male or female, have to find their own topics of interest. I firmly do not believe that professors should push their own interests necessarily onto the students. Uh, the dissertation and what will, would luck, become your first book in this area. Um, it's got to be something that will carry your interest through a number of years. And somebody just telling you, oh, do this or do that. You know. Certainly professors can give some suggestions or areas to look into or something around topics that um, a graduate student might uh, like to pursue. But I think it, you have to choose your own way. And it's one of the things I am proud about, about my own graduate students. They have gone off in so many different uh, directions. <laughs> of, of uh, their own interests and to try to encourage them in that. Of course, <clears throat> this is a problem for the professor then because you sometimes don't know very much <laughs> about what the student is <laughs> actually doing. So you can't always be as helpfully critical <laughs> as you might if they stayed within the certain boundaries of one's own expertise. But uh, I think um, it's good to pursue your your own way here. I don't know, I just found it um, 
I mean, natural isn't maybe a good word here, but um, uh, to be helpful, certainly having been such, so strongly involved with the women's movement before I ever got to thinking about being a graduate mentor, um, meant that I'd always wanted to be encouraging of women, et cetera. And I hope I've been encouraging of my male students too, of whom I have some very wonderful ones. And, but um, yeah, so sort of give, give them a, somewhat of a free reign, jump very hard on their writing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of red ink on the page, which can be quite deflating, especially if you'd been an A student in college, maybe, and all of a sudden find your writing so criticized here. But uh, yeah, uh, that I've, I've tried to help a lot of students um, with uh, here too. So, and I've, I've never really found it a burden. I mean, most of the graduate students I've worked with have been so wonderful. People ask me, oh, what's the best thing about your career, the greatest thing about your career? I say, it's all the wonderful graduate students that came out of this uh, program who you know, have found their own way, pursuing their own topics. And fortunately, it was in a period when there were some jobs. And so um, you know, having jobs at various kinds of schools, and so, yeah. If, if I could just chime in here, one of the things that I just appreciated so much, um, you opened your house, like, just mm -hmm. constantly, right? Um, th th it, th it was programmed twice a month for an early Christian studies reading group and a theory group, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was the doors wide open. Um, and, and then there were other, there were other gatherings <laughs> on top of that, right? In, in my entire career, I have never met anyone who was who was so hospitable in that way um, to students, to colleagues, and and, and so forth. And it's, you know, it, it is it's just it's it's very inspirational um, uh, and and loving, frankly. Um, Thank you. I considered that um, certainly the kind of lecture series we were able to to have back in those days, and um, to have the speakers come from hither and yon and give their talks and then somebody take them out to dinner and then come back to my place and, uh, with whatever kind of drinks one might want right. <laughs> and uh, uh, to get to meet and talk with uh, some of the most prominent people in the field. I think that was a very important part of development for the graduate students and um, in my era. And, um, it wasn't hard for me to do. I don't know, maybe I grew up in a family where my mother always had lots of hospitality for other people. So <laughs> it didn't seem like a hard thing <laughs> just to lay in a few refreshments and invite people over. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one final question. This actually comes from a doctoral student at Fordham, uh, Claire, Claire Cohen. Uh, she writes, recent developments within feminist studies have urged an opening up of feminism to include minority and non-Western experiences of oppression, agency, and empowerment. It seems that a broader interpretation of feminist concerns in early Christian texts might, might be a greater attention to marginalized voices more broadly. Do you think that drawing attention to issues such as discrimination, stereotypes, and tropes based on skin color in early Christian texts might be uh, as effective in challenging hierarchical modes of thinking and writing as explicitly feminist critiques of hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's so much, at least in Greek and Latin text, as I was mentioning before, you do get these references here and there, not very many, about Ethiopians and uh, so forth. Um, you know, you get mention of slaves, it's certainly economic discrimination, that the Roman Empire in this period had uh, as great inequality of wealth as we see today in America. So that's uh, perhaps a theme that I, that I think would be well worth pursuing to uh, track out what we're talking about here. One has to read a lot of kind of economics about late antiquity and so forth, which many of us were not really well trained to do, but we can plow through it and see what we get. Okay. All right, Liz, we'll, we'll, we'll 
we'll call it a day there. I, I, I just, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to do this. Um, uh, I can't thank you enough for what you've meant uh, to me in, in my own career and, and, and to, to so many other students. We've really enjoyed having you with us and uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, George, for inviting me. And thank you for the questions and for the audience out there. And may we all get through these trying times in one way or another. Right? Thank you so much.